Turn with me to John 12. John 12. <clears throat> Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. That's verse 24. And that's maybe the central verse in, in, in this passage as we're going to be looking at it today. We're going to go through the, the passage and we're going to see a lot, I hope, and pray. And that God's going to reveal things and that we're going to see this whole passage in a new light. With the whole goal at the end of us being that grain of wheat. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. <clears throat> we're going to start in verse um, 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was of, from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Then Philip came to and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And so all the way up until here, Jesus has said over and over again, my time has not yet come, my hour has not come. It's in John 2, 4, 7, 6, 7, 8, uh, and then I think 7, 3. It's in, it's in several places where he says, my time has not yet come. And all of a sudden we get to here and he says, my time is here, the time has come. Why? He knew there was something, he, he understood that as soon as the Gentiles started seeking him out, that that was the time. And so all it took was these Gentile Greek, these Greeks who came to worship at the feast. They weren't Jewish, they were God-fearers. They came to worship at the feast. So as soon as they show up, they go and seek Jesus. And as soon as word gets to Jesus that the Gentiles are, are seeking him, he knows that, that's, that his, his time is, is over. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That's referring to his death. The hour has come. Verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor he that loves his life, verse 20, 25 through 26, he that loves his life. So in verse 24, Jesus is first pointing to himself. He's, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And he's referring to himself first of all, but then all of a sudden, and it's referring to his death and resurrection, that through his death, that many, many people are going to come to him. Millions and millions will come to Christ Jesus. And he'll be multiplied in their lives. But then he goes beyond that. He doesn't just leave it there. He, 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 he points to them, to the disciples, basically, in, in his next words. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And so what's that about? We're going to talk about that. Why is it necessary to hate your life? Isn't that so contrary to what we hear today? We hear build your life and, and you know, make yourself something and you know, fix fix all these areas and self-help and improvement and build, build, build. And Jesus is giving the opposite message. He's saying, no, no, no. I want you to hate your life in this world. What does that mean? What does it mean? So it comes from the word meseo, to, to detest, uh, by extension to love less, um, to hate or to, to pursue with hatred or to detest. So why is it necessary? So so here's, here's a couple of reasons we're going to look at. It's ne necessary to, to hate your life in this world as compared to eternal life in heaven for those who love Christ. It's, it's compared to eternal life in heaven. It's necessary to hate your life based on its contents. 
It's necessary to hate your life in order to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It's necessary to hate your life in order for your prayers to be answered. And it's necessary to hate your life. And so the faith of Jesus Christ living in you can be multiplied. So we're going to look at those. So first one, you must hate your life in this world as compared to eternal life. So when God begins to open our spiritual eyes to give us spiritual understanding, we, we start to realize that, that his promises that he gives us are, are, are infinitely better than anything that we've got here. He makes it known to us that our home is not here any longer. Our home is in heaven. John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Why? So that where I am, there you may be also. Our hope transfers from the things of this earth to heaven, where Christ is at the right hand of God the Father, where he's making a home for us. And so we can be with him forever. And then even if you could live here for a thousand years or ten thousand years, what would those years be filled with? Pain and sorrow, they'd be filled with tears. You'd hurt others and you'd be hurt yourself. You'd suffer losses. And most of all, you wouldn't be present with the Lord. You wouldn't have the level of fellowship that he wants to have with you and that every true Christian longs to have with him. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we are confident, yes, rather pleased to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. He's saying, that's my hope. That's what I want. I'll be here as long as I need to. I'll do the work. I'll be a good soldier. But my heart is not here. My heart is with Christ in heaven. Amazing grace to him. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The joys of heaven are imaginable. Unimaginable. Eyes not seen nor ears heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. You and I can't even fathom it. And those joys are so abundantly glorious that the cost of entrance is commensurate. The cost is none other than the blood of Christ, the Savior. There's nothing in the universe that's ever been purchased that, that's amounted to that sum. You can't purchase that from your own spiritual bank account. You and I are destitute. We're completely broke spiritually. We're in the, we're in the red. We're negative spiritually. And so if you, if you were to, or I squandered the opportunity to grasp the gift of salvation, to let it, to let it sift through your fingertips, how, how will you purchase it a second time? It came by grace once and you scorned it. Are you depending that by grace it's going to come again? It may not. But it, it came by grace the first time. And, and even if it were to come around a second time to you, what would make you think that your response would be any different? Have you changed as a person? No, you haven't. How ungrateful and unworthy is the wretch who doesn't attend to the most precious gift ever bestowed upon mankind, but takes it for granted and miserably and knowingly takes it for granted that it's the only gift by which heaven can be attained. Is that person worthy of heaven? Not according to Christ? No. The ones who are worthy of heaven are the ones who see the pearl of great price and they recognize its value. They see the market, they understand the value of things and they understand forgiveness is, cannot be purchased, but they see the pearl of great price and they say, I'm gonna sell everything. What does that mean? I'm selling my whole life, all of who I was, all of who I ever could be. I'm selling all of it so I can get this pearl of great price. They don't have to find it a second time because they recognize its, its value the first time. In the first instant that they lay eyes on the pearl, they understand its value. When Christ is presented to them, the weight of their sins, in addition to the compelling grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, irresistibly draws them. They can't hold back. They can't look away. They only look to Christ. Nothing else matters. Christ is all, and all is Christ. And then in their heart they say, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you say that in your heart? You can have all the world. Just give me Jesus. 
Or like Paul, I've been crucified to the world. And the world's been crucified to me. There's no loss of love between us. I hate the world and the world hates me. It's an ir irreconcilable relationship because I've been redeemed. I've been changed. I've become a new person. I'm part of the family of God. And I would have it no other way. I don't want to be friends with the world any longer. So it's true that he who loves his life in this world will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Remember the ten virgins, the ten young maidens in Matthew 25? Matthew 25, when you hear the call that every person hears in the moments or seconds leading up to their death, and that call says, behold, the bridegroom's coming. Then it's time to make your final preparations for meeting with Christ. And the wives trimmed their lamps. They even had something to do. They weren't all the way ready. And that consisted of removing the charred portion of the wick and raising the wick by means of a, of, a, of a little hook and so it, so, it could, so it could burn brighter. But the foolish ones, oh, the foolish ones, they said to the wise, give us, we need something. Give us some of your oil. And the wise said, there wouldn't be enough for both of us. It's too late. Go find some for yourself. Matthew Henry said, said about this, even those best prepared for death have to work to actually get ready. He said, an outward profession may light a man along this world, but the damps of the valley of the shadow of death will put out such a light. Those, who, those that would be saved must have grace of, the, of, the, of their own. And those that have the most grace, even they have none to spare. There won't be enough for us and you. Even the best need more from Christ. He says, Matthew and Henry, many will seek admission into heaven when it's too late. The vain confidence of hypocrites will carry them far in expectations of happiness. But the, but the unexpected summons of death may alarm the Christian, but proceeding without delay to trim his lamp, his graces often shine more bright. While the mere professor, the, the hypocrite, the mere professor's conduct shows that his lamp is going out. Watch, therefore, attend to the business of your souls. Be in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Don't expect you'll have time to get right with God before death. Or later in life, if that's your plan, then the Bible calls you a fool and promises that you'll have no such opportunity. If you don't heed this warning, to, this warning today and prepare yourself today, then what makes you think that you would heed a warning similar in the moments before death? You won't listen to it then either if you won't listen to it today. We must be full of the grace of Christ as seen in living the Christian life today, every day. You can't afford to lack walking with Christ even for one day because that day might be the day that you hear, behold, the bridegroom's coming. And everyone who loves Christ anxiously waits for his return. They're not caught up in the affairs of this life. That would be disastrous and they know it. We must not be those who believe for a while and then time of temptation or persecution fall away. We must not be those that, that get caught up with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. We must be those who, having heard the word of God with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. There are so many warnings in Scripture regarding the sudden coming of Christ. Another one, Luke 12, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourselves like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding so that, so that when he knocks on the door, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom his master when he comes will find watching. For I tell you truly that he'll gird himself, he'll make them to sit down, he'll gird himself and he'll uh, come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, then blessed are those servants. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We wait and we watch faithfully for Christ to receive us into heaven. At whatever, t at whatever time he bids, only he determines the time. Whether it's during the first watch of life when we're young and strong and careless or carefree, or whether it's during the second watch of life, when we're, when we're carrying a heavier load and, and most enjoy families, 
family, our families and friends. Or maybe it'll happen during the third watch of life when a person's full of gray hair and, uh, and, and they become lonely as uh, seeing one friend after another pass away. But no matter what watch of the night it is that Christ comes and the cry is made to you, behold, the bride, bridegroom comes. We must be found watching and waiting. I have an uncle who was a, who was a SEAL, Navy SEAL in Vietnam, and there was one mission that they were going to go on. It was had like a, a 2% or 5% chance of survival, and they ended up not going on it, but they were going to get, get dropped off by parachuting this one area, and then hike by foot 10 miles, and then go into this harbor and plant, um, you know, plant, um, explosives somewhere and then swim out further into the harbor and there was going to be one boat that comes by. One boat. And, the, and in, in typical Navy SEAL fashion, they hold their, they, be, they keep their, their head above water and they keep, have, have their one arm, you know, held in a hook above the water as, the, as they heard the boat coming and the boat wasn't going to make a U-turn, it wasn't going to come a second time, but there was going to make, there was going to make one trip and if they were in the right position and their arm was held in the, in the air just like that, then they they use a like a bike inner tube or whatever to go ahead and and and, and, and grab the, the person and yank them on board the boat as as they're driving by without stopping. That's what it's like, waiting for Christ. The boat won't come back a second time. It won't make a make a U turn and come back around to pick up any stragglers. If you're not waiting in that line, you will get left. And the love of this world will, will lull you into a complacency in loving Christ. Complacency in the things of God is a luxury far beyond what you and I could ever afford. Are you watching? Are you anxiously waiting his return? Are you ready right now? There's far too much at stake to leave anything undone. Have the charms of this world, the sins of this world, even the good things that are magnified into, into the wrong proportions, have they stolen your attention from, from Christ, from, from anxiously waiting, him, waiting for your master? If so, he bids you fix your eyes upon Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes upon him. Listen to his words. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it unto life eternal. According to the Lord Jesus Christ, hating your life in this world is the only remedy for the problem of getting caught up in, in being distracted and complacent. The love of this world will rob you of eternity in the next. If you would made, be made fit for heaven, you must hate your life in this world as compared to eternal life in heaven. And you must hate your life based on its contents. When God begins to open the eyes of a person, he first shows them who they are, who we are. He shows us the, the, the loved ones that we've hurt. He impresses on us the guilt for our hateful actions that we've inflicted upon those that have been, that have been entrusted to us to love. And all those things alike are known to God and, he, and they're known to our hearts too and he shows them to us and he shows us the treachery of our own hearts that the heart is deceitful above all things. He showed us, shows us the lies that we've damaged along the way, the words that we've spoken that have pierced people, the lies that we've spread, the reputations that we've damaged, the pain that we've caused, the joy that we've robbed from other people from living joyfully when we said something that killed their joy. And so he shows us who we are. And then he shows us that we've broken his standards, his standards of holiness. He showed us, shows us that we've sinned against the Holy Creator to whom all life is due. And that, and that we've spurned and hated his, his instruction, His guidance. We've ran away from His presence at every opportunity, even though He's loved us along the whole way and helped us again and again when He didn't have to. And he shows us that you've, that you've taken the Lord's name in vain. You've rejected his word, his book for how to live. You've mocked his holy scriptures, taken part in idolatry and sensuality. You've lied and perjured yourself. You've laughed at God's people. 
and mocked them, do you deserve heaven? Only a fool would say he does. Think of all the ones, all those that you've hurt. Think of the wrong things that you've done. Are you proud of those things? Nobody forced you to do those things. You chose those of your own free will. Even a child is known by his deeds, Proverbs 20.11 says. Those actions are the words, and those actions and words are a summary of who you are at heart. Without a change in heart, even if you could go back however many years and restart the exact same things would happen without a new heart because the heart's the same. Are you proud of what you've done? Are you proud of what you've become? Because that's your life. If you, if you strip off the money and the polish and the facade and the smooth speech, that's what you're left with, is the brokenness, the broken path that you've inflicted upon others in your past. Do you love that life or do you hate that life? If you love your life, if you love what you've done, then you'll keep doing it, all of it. And ever increasing more and more and more. You'll keep hurting people, you'll keep doing the same things, you'll keep... Until the day that you die, and then beginning that day, your judgment will begin. And that day you'll be filled with remorse and tears and weeping uncontrollable as you begin suffering for sins that could never be paid for. You can rework amazing grace to him. When you've been there 10,000 years in burnings like the sun, you've no less days to regret choices made than when you first begun. After your first 10,000 years, then you only have a trillion, trillion, trillion more of those 10,000 year segments to go. Do you love that life or do you hate that life? You must hate, the, hate your life in this world based on its contents, based on what it's made of you, based on what you've become because of it. You either love that or you hate it. And if you love Christ, then, you, then you're forced to hate that life. If you hate that life, then you run to Christ for forgiveness. You plead at his feet and say, I'm so unworthy. And I don't even deserve to have an audience with you to ask this question, but Lord, if you can save the most wretched sinner, then you found him, or you found her. Would you please save me? Would you please make me into a new creation? I don't want to be who I used to be. That's what it means to hate your life in this world. You hate it based on its contents. You must hate your life in this world as compared to eternal life in heaven. You must hate your life in this world based on its contents. And you must hate your life in this world in order to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24 points to the coming death and benefit it will have for others. And verse 25, he turns the sayings upon the disciples, calling them to hate their life in this world also. In verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. Follow him where? Follow him into hating his, hating his old life? Follow him into persecutions? If you hate, if, until you hate your life in this world, you can't serve Christ because until then, you're going you're gonna to hedge your bets with this world. <clears throat> until you hate your life in this world, you're internally going to be saying, well, I'm pretty sure about this, this Christianity thing's true, but I'm not that convinced, and so I don't want to be persecuted. So I'm going to make friends with the world so I can avoid persecution. Not siding too much with Christ for fear of rejection by the world. You'll be trying to serve two masters, which means you're not serving Christ at all. Until you, until you turn and make 100% Hold on to Christ, even at the expense of being hated by the world. You're not even serving Christ. How do we enter into God's family? By the, by the work of grace, where God reveals to us how wretched and miserable we are spiritually. And then by that same work of grace, he turns our eyes to look upon Jesus Christ, where we can find forgiveness, and he gives us the strength to run to Christ. To fall upon that rock, of, that rock upon which we're broken. And 
broken, broken over who we become. And only then do we belong to Christ. Only then do we have an exchanged life. Only then have we changed our old life to a new life. And only then can we have peace with God. Because as long as we're living for ourselves, there is no peace with God. And only then will we stop defending and justifying ourselves or striving for self. Only then do we realize that there's nothing worth defending about our old life. It deserves to be put in the grave. What's worth justifying out of the shameful things that we've done in our past? What's worth justifying those? What's worth defending the putrid self and flesh that have made us into what we are without Christ? What's worth defending in that? What of our defiled past is worth striving for? Even if, even if our striving, striving was successful, it would only produce more of the same in the future. Same of the, more of the same that we just ran away from. None of it's worth defending or justifying or striving for. Reputation, self-will, self-justification, no more. All of it's garbage, and in the garbage it, 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 it must go. But when you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, then you have no care for self, no care for the flesh. When per persecution comes against you, then you can, you, can, you can lay down against it and not strive, not fight, not try to protect yourself through it. As long as we're justifying ourselves, we're full of strife, striving to protect ourselves. When we're squeezed, strife comes out. Just like the toothpaste tube. What are you on the inside? It shows when you're squeezed. As long as we're protecting ourselves, we're not showing real love. Just a cold, hard, lifeless rock. Not until we stop defending ourselves, stop justifying ourselves, stop protecting our reputation, stop defending our will, stop striving for our needs. Not until we stop all those self things can we begin standing for the Lord. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And don't think that this is an, an additional bonus for super spiritual Christians. It's not. This is, or, or that even this is the mature Christian. This is, this is baby step number one. This is the bottom rung of the ladder. This is the initial baseline requirement. This is just what it is to become a Christian. It's like the car model that has the crank windows. In 2020, hating your own life isn't meat for the advanced Christian, it's milk for the baby Christian. The writer of Hebrews acknowledges this. He wrote in chapter 10, verse 32. But recall, to, this is to, to Christians who are struggling, who's reminding them of what it was like when they first came to Christ. Recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. Joyfully accepted the plundering of their goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. And only then we're fit for the master's use. Only then is when we're sent on mission from Christ into our own Judea. But as soon as we come to that point, as soon as we become a follower of Christ, let him who serves me follow me. As soon as we see our wretched, miserable old self, and we go and fall upon the rock of Jesus Christ and he gives us new life. In that instant, as, as, as we long for his glory, as we seek his glory, and we let our own lives, our own selves, we hate our lives in this world, then in that instant, you're on mission for Christ. <clears throat> you don't have to go somewhere. You're already on mission for Christ right where you're at. In every circumstance you're in, everywhere you go, you're on mission for Christ. You don't have any problems anymore. You have a father who takes care of your problems. He takes responsibility for you and for everything about you. And so only by hating our old life can we be successful and persecuted for Christ. Can, can, you, can you believe those words are put together? 
in a sentence, successful in being persecuted for Christ. What, is that, what does that mean? It means you go through persecution just like Christ went through his persecution. He opened not his mouth. They accused him falsely. He knew it. He didn't open his mouth. That's Christ in you. That's how, you, that, that's how he is going to be inside of you so you can respond in the same way. Because until you hate your old life, then when persecution comes upon you, you're going to respond in the same way that you've always responded, with the same fleshly means. And so in order to successfully go through persecution, and persecution will happen, in order to be successful in it, and navigating through it like Jesus Christ taught and showed, you have to hate your old life. You have to choose to do it his way. And so in order to serve Christ, you have to hate your old life. In order to have prayer answered, you have to hate your old life. We must follow Christ in hating our life. We must follow Christ in the persecutions. We must follow Christ in his lifestyle. Verse 26. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. There are so many voices in this world say they're speaking for Christ. Saying they're Christ's true church, Christ's true voice. And it's caused so many people to wander, to grope about, and to be, to be hurt in their hands and to wonder what the truth is. And, and, and people wonder, what are the identifying marks of a real Christian? How can I tell who's real? But the Lord Jesus Christ says a person can, says that we can identify the true servants because of their lifestyle of following Christ. If any man serves me, let him follow me. Many, many people call themselves Christians, but their lifestyle doesn't match what Christ's lifestyle is like. Look for the ones who look like Christ. The meek and humble, that's what Christ is. And when you find that, then you found where Christ is. Where, where, where I am, there my servant will be also. And then where that person is um, who's, who's serving Christ, prayers will be answered. And that's, and that's number five. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. To have your prayers answered, you have to hate your old life to have your prayers answered. Where the, well, the Father honors the faithful servant of Christ by answered by answer prayers. Matthew 6, 6, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut your door, pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. That's how God shows his delight. For prayers prayed from a pure heart, from a life lived in good conscience, in service to Christ. But for those who, who don't, prayers won't be answered. Psalm 50, 14, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. If you're living for Christ, hating your old life, then when you call upon the Lord in your day of trouble, He will deliver you. His word promises to deliver you. You may even choose to not accept that deliverance and so you can obtain a better resurrection, but He'll offer you deliverance. But so many prayers go unanswered because they're not rendered from an obedient heart. Proverbs 1.23 says, Turn to my rebuke, and surely I will pour my spirit out upon you. I'll make my words known to you. And then it contrasts against those that don't. Those that don't turn at God's rebuke. <clears throat> because I've called and you refused, I've stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you've disdained all my counsel and, and wanted none of my rebuke none of my correction. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then you will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. If you want your prayers to be answered, then you have to hate your old life. You can't be living and walking in that old life. And then You must hate your old life in order to multiply. That's back in verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. The best you can do apart from Christ 
Loving your life in this world is to multiply yourself to those that see you. And is that really what you want to do? Is that the high standard that Christ wants? That Christ has called us to? And if the answer is that that's not what you want to produce, if you want to produce those who are watching you and learning from you, those that maybe at work who see you, if you want to produce grain that's of the quality, the caliber that Christ wants, then you have to die, I have to die. I have to die to that old, old self. Your old life must die. But the promise is, where that grain does die, a grain of wheat goes into the ground, it can't multiply unless it dies. And unless you die to yourself, you can't multiply Christ and anybody else. But once you die to self, then you have something to offer. Then the, then the Lord has something to multiply in other people. And that single grain can turn into a, a harvest, to a, to a whole field after a couple generations, and God could do the same thing with you and with me. But first, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. In order to multiply how God wants us to multiply, then we have to die the self. And then we go through persecutions, and that's in Matthew 10, if you could turn over to Matthew 10. <clears throat> 10 and 16. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And we're going to do a little rock skip across the top of this. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, because as soon as you, as soon as you or I come to this point of seeing who we are and choosing to hate our life in this world so that we can have eternal life, as, as soon as that happens, then you and I are on mission because we're in this world. We can't step away from it. We're right in the middle of it already. And it's a world that's avowed to hate God and all of his children. And by coming to Christ Jesus in truth, you have become his child and so you have become an enemy of this world. And those of this world, the sons of this world, will, will see that very quickly. And they will turn their guns upon you. And they will be relentless. And they will be harsh. And so, <clears throat> and so it's worth it for us to take a look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 10. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We're to be wise. Not to be foolish. If you're not wise, then people will take advantage of you endlessly. Be wise. Otherwise, you'll be unduly harmed. God's going to navigate you through this world, but you need wisdom to get through it. I need wisdom to get through it. And harmless. You have to be harmless. If you're not harmless, then the mission won't succeed. Then all you're doing is the same things that you've done before, living from the self, living from the flesh. If you're abiding in Christ, if you're in Christ, then your response is going to be harmless. Wise and harmless. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before. So what's, what's the promise? They're going to deliver you and scourge you, and then they're going to bring you before kings. Why? For Christ's sake is a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Your sufferings are going to bring out Christ's glory. We're going to bring out the gospel so Christ can be known. Verse 19, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. The two gifts that will be given to you in that hour is peace. Do not worry about what you're going to have to say. And then the message. God will give you enough of a message. And it, you may not think it's much, but it will be plenty. He'll give you enough of a message. For it's not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and the father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. How many are going to hate you? All. All of this world. The only refuge that you will find is in a God-fearing church where Christ is preached, where sin is scorned, and where love and fellowship abounds. That's the only hope, that's the only place of refuge that you or I have in this world. 
hated, brother will deliver up brother to death, parents and children will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. That, that hasn't changed. Nobody is saved unless they endure to the end. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another, for assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. He's saying, if you can get away from persecution, then get away from it. Flee to the next city. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, and a servant like his master. So the context of this is suffering. This is persecution. This is the world hating you. And so the, the purpose for verse 24 and 25 is to set your expectation in mind. It's, it's, it's inaccurate to say Christ suffered so that I don't have to. You would be setting yourself above your teacher. And you, the servant, would be setting yourself above your master. But a disciple is not above his teacher. And a servant is not above his master. If they've called... Uh, the, the master of the house bills above how much more will they call those of his household Christ suffered not so that you can avoid suffering Christ suffered to teach you how to suffer to show you how to go through it God could have ginned up some other way for Christ to have given the sacrifice that he gave without us having to see the, the gory details of what Christ went through, but he allowed us to see those things so we could learn how we're supposed to approach suffering and persecution also. He suffered to show us how to suffer rightly. <clears throat> and so we're to be like Christ in suffering, to do it his way. So by hating your life in this world, you become useful to Christ. You become an enemy of this world, and you and you'll be persecuted for us or for it. The world hasn't changed. The only way to not suffer persecution in this world is to make friends with it. And Jesus talked about that in one parable, and we won't go there. But the short story is, the person who makes friends with the world is an is a is an unrighteous servant. And they're hedging their bets and so they can have a better eternity with those same people apart from the presence of the Lord. Christ living in you, the more Christ lives in you, the more the world will hate you and the more you'll suffer. It's inevitable. It's been happening for 2,000 years. It's been happening for seven or seven and a half thousand years. Why? Because there's an enmity between the seed of this world and the seed of God. There's, the child of the flesh always persecutes the child of promise. The Cains always kill the Abels. There's no way around it. While, while we're in this world, as long as you're walking in this world, that's the way it's going to be. That's why we look to Christ. That's why we look to heaven as our home. That's why we look to him as our redeemer who we long to be with. As long as you're walking in Christ, the fruit of the Spirit flowing through you, then you can be certain that how they treat you is how they treat Christ. Because Christ is in you. That's the hope of glory. And so as Christ is in you, however they treat you, however, however others treat you is how they treat Christ. You want to see who he's opening the door to, their hearts? Look at the ones who are um, showing you kindness. Those are the ones, that's how they would treat Christ. Look at the, and then you want to see those that are the most hostile against Christ? Look at the ones who are persecuting you the most. Those are the ones who hate Christ the most. You're just a mini version of Christ. Imperfect, but, sim but similar imitation of Christ. And whatever they've called Christ, they'll call you worse in verse 25. However they've treated Christ, they'll treat you in the same way. They'll hate you and detest you. They'll speak harmful, hurtful things to you, against you, about you. Because hatred is in their heart. They haven't been made new. Verse 26, but we're not to fear them. We're supposed to fear someone, but it's not them. We're supposed to fear him who, after a person has been destroyed, we're supposed to fear the one who has the power to cast them into hell. That's God. And then verse 30, 31, but the very hairs of your are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin in 29, and not one of them is falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not therefore fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. Does that bring you comfort? 
that brings me comfort because you know what this you know what those three verses tell me that God will not spend your life needlessly precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints he will not be somebody who's willing to to live for Christ somebody who, who chooses to hate their life in this world so they can have eternal life with Christ God is not going to waste your life in spending it in some place that's not worthy of it being spent. If he calls you to a sacrifice, then that's at his bidding. We're, we're his servants. He's, he's the master. He's the Lord. He's our creator. But if he calls you or I to a sacrifice, then he's not wasting his, his servant. You're of more value than many sparrows. He will not needlessly, uselessly throw your life away. So what's the purpose of persecution and suffering? <clears throat> the purpose of it is to draw people to Christ Jesus. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but in Acts chapter 2, feel free to go and turn over there. We're just going to look at briefly at Acts chapter 2. When, when Peter's giving his sermon, <clears throat> he's giving this sermon to people who witnessed the sufferings of Christ, the people who were in the crowd and called out and said, crucify him, crucify him. And in verse 36, chapter, th chapter th 2, verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The purpose of the people who saw Christ suffering, who were the voices against Christ, who were accountable for putting Christ to death themselves, the purpose for Christ's suffering was to win those people that, to put him to death. And it happened here in Acts chapter 2. Those same people, if they had not lifted up their hand against Christ, lifted up their voices against Christ, then this sermon would have had no effect upon them. But God calls people to attention for their own sins. And so when people persecute you, then you become the instrument by which God is going to reach them. That's the purpose of suffering, that you would be multiplied, that Christ would be multiplied through you in reaching those who are your persecutors. Suffering is not fun to go through, but unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, then it brings forth much fruit. The pilgrims 400 years ago, <clears throat> they had just come out of the Reformation. And back then, the only way to keep your... <clears throat> and so the Reformation had already undergone corruption. And so, and so in England, there, were, there was you know, periods of times when it shifted hands of, of the leadership of the sovereign, of, of the ruler, and this one would be Protestant, the next one would be Catholic, the next one would be Protestant. And the only way to keep your life and your family and your job was to either have no convictions about religion whatsoever and just go with the flow, whatever, you know, take the oaths or whatever it takes to live to be a Catholic and the next, with the next king or queen to live and be a Protestant, just to go with the flow, whatever, to have no convictions about religion, to bend to whoever is in power, to the will of whoever is in power. But if you were a person that had real convictions, then you were persecuted back then. And many people were killed back then. But in those times, even, even amidst the corruption in the Catholic Church, and even in the Protestant Church in England, the corruptions were happening. Even amidst all those corruptions, and the Church had started to, even just out of the Reformation, the Church had started to digress into, or deg uh, regress into darkness. And so because, and so because of that, because the word of God could still be read, there were people who would read the word of God and they would see light and they would say, look, I think it needs to change my life. I think I need to change my life. And, and so then they would let it change their lives and they would gather together and they started to receive light in maybe the late 1500s. <clears throat> so this is a little bit about that, written by William Bradford of, of Plymouth Plantation. He says, 
When as by the travail and diligence of some godly and zealous preachers, and God's blessing on their labors as in other places of the land, so in the northern parts of England, many became enlightened by the word of God and had their ignorance and sins discovered unto them. That's a blessing. Today people don't want that. But back then they saw that as a grace of God that he would reveal their ignorance and their sins being discovered to them. And then, and then began by God's grace to reform their lives and make conscience of their want and, and, and make conscience of their ways. The work of God was no sooner manifest in them, but presently they were both scoffed and scorned by the profane multitude. Why? Because as soon as somebody turns away from their life in this world and decides to hate it so they could, they could grasp hold of Christ, then they're on mission and the world will, will turn their turn their guns upon that person. And that's what happened back in the 1500s. <clears throat> and, then, and then Bradford continued and, and he talked about how the, once the Catholics were all about ceremonies, as long as they could put you through more ceremonies and, and, and distract you from Christ, then that's what they seemed to be about. And, and then there was corruption in, on the English side of the church. And they began to persecute all the zealous people who were professing Christ in the land, all those who were zealous in, of Christ in the land, they, they began to be persecuted. And he says, and the more the light of the gospel grew, the more they urged their subscriptions to these corruptions, the more they forced corruptions upon the people. On the other sin, on the other hand, sin has been countenanced. <clears throat> and so religion has been disgraced. The godly have been grieved, afflicted, persecuted, and many exiled. Many have lost their lives in prisons and other ways. But on the other hand, sin has been noticed and nothing said about it. Ignorance, profaneness, and atheism increased in the papists encouraged to hope again for a day. And so those who had been given light were escaping the corruption of this world. And they were being persecuted for it. And the more they escaped, the more they were persecuted. <clears throat> so the difference between the pilgrims and the Puritans is the pilgrims were a small The Puritans were the ones that said, we need to reform the Church of England, but we're going to stay in the Church of England to do that. And the, and, and the pilgrims said, they were separatists. They said, no, 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 we need to separate. They left the shores of England for the new world. <clears throat> and in doing so, they became pilgrims. Those who were afraid of dying didn't get on the ship. Or those who, whose hearts were turned back, they had opportunity to, to get off when the speed well turned around and brought people home, and so they, so they didn't go either. The ones who boarded the ship did so because it would, not, not because it would be safe, but because they hated their life in this world. And they were turning their back on this world. And so that made them useful for the master. And now they looked forward to only that which, for which Christ was calling them. So 102 people boarded the Mayflower. 40 of them were the pilgrims. As they called themselves the friends. And then 62 strangers they called them. Freedmen, indentured servants, and hired men. All 40 of the pilgrims landed and they had, they had a baby while they were on the way. They had so little money, they had been persecuted their whole lives. They prayed over their meager barrels of food and water. Just prayed that the, that amount of food would get them the whole way. They rationed their, their food supplies and they lived in love and in kindness with one another for 66 days on board. And then when they got there, they had no home to go to. They had no inn to keep them warm. They showed up at the beginning of a harsh winter with nowhere to stay. And they built one house called the Common House where they could all live together. They arrived in time, just in time to begin a cold, harsh winter with no provisions. And by the end of the first year, 51 of them, of the, of the 102, had died. Four families were wiped out. Only three married couples were left. Only five of the 18 wives survived. Many parents had literally sacrificed their lives for their children. But the next April, when the Mayflower turned around to go towards England, not even one of those pilgrims, those separatists, went with the Mayflower. Not even one returned to their home in England. They, they all stayed. And their sacrifice paved the way for others. 
to live out the dream that they had. They had this dream to live out the Christian faith, how they saw from the Bible, to gather together with those like-minded, to not be imposed upon by ceremonies or corruptions, but to be able to live free under the, in the light of God's word as he's given. And many of them didn't even get a chance to, many of them didn't live long enough to get a chance to see that really happen hardly. But because of them, their sacrifice, 10 years later, the Puritans landed. With 17 ships and 1,000 passengers. And, and by 10 years later, 20,000 Puritans had crossed the Atlantic to join the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Your life matters. You may think nothing's going on. You may think you're wasting your time. You may think there's no fruit to show for your labors. But all of those thoughts are lies from the enemy. If a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, then it must produce much fruit. The spiritual work of repentance that you're doing matters. Turning away from sin matters. Learning to love others from the heart matters. Demonstrating mercy and forgiveness matters. Walking in the light that you've received matters. Living a life of holiness as much as God empowers you matters. Your spiritual sacrifice of thankfulness to God matters. You may not see the importance of your life, most of these pilgrims never saw the importance of their own life. But their lives and sac their lives and their sacrifices mattered. As it paved the way for others to live out the dream that they had. And today our and in today, there's so many similarities to the pilgrim story. Instead of corruption being imposed on us by a church structure, it's imposed on us by a societal structure. And so we have the same issues with, with so much of the church. And so we're just one of the small groups that gets together and we see light in God's word. And we see the call to repent and to turn away from our ways. And so we do that and we seek more light in God's word and he graciously grants us more light. But it, but it comes at a cost. It comes with at the cost of persecution. It comes at a cost of suffering. Just exactly like Christ said would happen. Just like what happened with the pilgrims. The more light God reveals, the more that we would be persecuted. But God has plans. And we, don't, we can't see the end of those plans. We don't know where they're going. But we do know that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So it may not look like we're doing a lot here. We're like the Puritans of our time, calling the church to live a life of repentance, calling the church back to the original words of the Master, calling the church to heed the words of Christ, and doing so from a position of meekness and humility, expecting persecution and suffering, and when it comes to handle persecution and suffering like Christ did, without defending ourselves, without opening our mouth. But hating our life in this world so that the life of Christ can be seen through us. So, I don't know whether what this work is going to look like. But I believe that God's doing something. And I'm thankful, so thankful for every person he's brought along in our little Mayflower. And we're thankful for all that God did to the pilgrims, through the pilgrims, to benefit our generation. And now we're laying the fountain the foundation so that God can use this.
however he wants to for other generations to produce much fruit. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful for what you've done. Thankful for the life that you've, that you've given us. Thankful for the light that you're shining on our path. It's only by your grace that we have any light whatsoever. Heavenly Father, help us to weather. <clears throat> help. Irresistibly draw us to Christ. Let us hate our lives in this world. Compared to heaven, compared to its contents, hate our lives in order to serve Christ in order to have answered prayer and in order to multiply. We choose to hate our lives in this world because we seek the better in the heavenly country where Christ sits on the throne and reigns at your right hand. And Heavenly Father, help us to weather the difficulties of life, the sufferings, the persecution just as the Lord Jesus Christ did. Through all those times, let Christ live in us. Let us respond like he did. And that will call and draw people To yourself. Just like seeing just like seeing Christ on the cross has drawn us to him. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would send more light. We ask that you would send awakening. We ask that you would send revival, conviction, repentance, renewal of Christian walk, Christian walk. Heavenly Father, we're calling out to you and asking you to do these things. You give good gifts to your children. Will you please send more light? Send awakening. Send revival. And we thank you in Jesus' name.